So Ray, this concept of, you know, fearing the Lord, this is something that gets a lot of attention in the church, but there are some misconceptions about, about it, especially outside of the church, the idea of fearing God and what that really means. So help us understand, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Well, the Bible says of Jesus, he was heard and that he feared. Um, the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I think the sobriety of fearing God is brought to us in what Jesus said. He said, fear not him who has power to kill your body and afterwards do no more, but fear him who has power to kill your body and cast your soul into hell. Fear him. We can gloss over that scripture and miss what Jesus is actually saying. He's saying, if a man's coming at you with a knife to plunge it into your chest, don't fear that man. Fear God. And the fear of someone trying to kill you is nothing compared to the fear of God. Many years ago, uh, when I lived in New Zealand, uh, as you can still hear, I have a slight accent, uh, maybe 30, 40 years ago, when the police had problems with criminals, they would hit them with sticks. They didn't use guns. They did the same thing in England. Naughty criminal, hit, hit. So when I came to the U.S. back in 1989, I had an advantage over many open-air preachers because when I saw a police officer walking towards me, all I could see was his gun. I'd say to myself, he's got a gun. And uh, police officers have stopped me open-air preaching at least a dozen times, and every time I've been incredibly congenial. They say, you want to move over there? I say, certainly, sir. <laughs> and I've moved like grease lightning. Never ha have I had trouble with the police because I know this gentleman could kill me if I move too quickly. If his life is in danger, I'm in big trouble. And so it's more than a reverence that I have for the police. It's a fear of what they can do for me, do to me. And that's what Jesus is saying. Fear not him who has power to kill your body and afterwards do no more, but fear him who has power to kill your body and cast your soul into hell. Obviously, as Christians, we're sheltered from God's wrath, but the ungodly don't fear him, and they're in danger of being cast into hell, something that horrifies us. Billy, let me just share a very personal anecdote to show the power of the fear of God. It's, it is very personal. When I was 16 years old, before I became a Christian, I learned what it was to fear God. I was out the back of a hall, a dance hall, at night in long grass with a gorgeous 16-year-old female. As we lay there, my intentions were not honorable. But she said something that put the fear of God in me, even though I wasn't a Christian. She said six words. She said, you know what? God's watching us. And that was like a huge bucket of ice fell on me, steam went up, and I just said, let's go back inside. The Bible says, through the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And even as a non-Christian, I learned the power of the fear of God. I could have got her pregnant. I could have shamed her parents, shamed my parents, maybe instigated an abortion. So I look back and thank God for the fear of the Lord. And that's what I cultivate as a Christian. I want to fear God because it's the beginning of wisdom. Why do you think there's such a pushback culturally and even within the church on this idea of fear? It's as though it's a bad thing to fear the Lord, the way that even believers talk about it sometimes. Why is there that reaction to it? I think it's the same problem that Israel had for uh, many, many years and many times in the Old Testament. The Bible says they got into idolatry. They bowed down to idols. And the reason idols are so um, attractive to sinful human beings is because they don't have a moral dictate. An idol doesn't say, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not bear false witness. It's a dumb idol and it doesn't have any moral dictates. So idolatry is attractive, not just the making of gods with our hands, but the making of God with our minds, the, the imagination, the place of imagery where we shake an, shape an image of our own image of God because it doesn't have a moral dictate. And America's image of God, secular America, and even some in the church, see God as that old guy in the sky, long beard, wearing a pink nighty, playing touch fingers with Adam. God is nothing like that. And if we want to get a little bit of the fear of God in us, we should move to Texas for a week or so, experience a thunderstorm, and those thunderings and lightnings tend to put the fear of God in us. You know, it's, it's intriguing, you know, when you look at how people talk about prayer, a lot of people assume, you know, okay, God, here's my prayer, regardless of where I am, regardless of what I'm doing spiritually. How does that work? Do you believe that's true? Is it not true? Well, if you want to have a, if you want to have an audience with the King of England, don't show up in your pajamas. It just won't happen. There is certain etiquette that needs to take place. And when you look at the Bible, there is definitely 
etiquette on steroids when it comes to talking with God. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Scriptures say, if I regard or have iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Now, the book of Isaiah says, our sins have made a separation between us and our God, so he will not hear. Now, obviously, God is omniscient and he hears everything, but it's talking about whether or not he will hear and regard our prayers. Now, that's not too important to most of us until we're hanging over a thousand foot cliff, cliff by our teeth or we're upside down at 20,000 feet in severe turbulence. That's when we need to know if God hears our prayers or not. And so we need to look at Scripture and let the fear of God fill our heart because the Bible says, through the fear of the Lord, men will depart from evil. We need to partake of the beginning of wisdom and make sure we have a right understanding of God's character and nature. One way to do that, besides moving to Texas, <laughs> is to read Scripture and see that God killed Ananias and Sapphira because they told one lie. Well, where God killed Uzzah because he steadied the ark, or God killed a man in Exodus 38 because he didn't like what he did sexually. And so it's very important to understand God's revelation of himself, to forsake our idols, and then fear the God that has revealed himself in Holy Scripture. You know, as, as you're going through those examples, you know, it's often, and you've heard this, right? People will look, even within the church, at the Old and the New Testament, and they'll look at the Old Testament and they'll say, gosh, there seems to be a disconnect as though it's two different gods, right? And they'll talk about the God of the Old Testament as being vengeful and angry. And, and you know, I'm not saying this. I'm just paraphrasing what they will say. Then they'll look at Jesus and they'll look at the God of the New Testament and they'll see it as completely different. Although you just gave some examples that would call that into question. But that oversimplification, which seems to be rooted in a misunderstanding of the connection between the two. I know I'm about to ask you something that's really a five hour podcast, um, but when we can condense the answer down. But but how should people be looking at that relationship between the old and the new? And, and how should we view that as believers? Well, God never changes. And the most fearsome manifestation of God's justice and his wrath and anger is seen at the cross. God became a human being. The scriptures say God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus was the express image of the invisible God. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And then we see the fury of God come upon him to satisfy the law of eternal justice. You know, one thing that put the fear of God into Israel was the thunderings and lightnings of Mount Sinai when God came to give his law. So fearful was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly fearful and quake. This was Moses, the friend of God, terrified when God came in, in peace with a smile on his face to give his law. Well, the Bible says he's coming again, but in wrath. But we can get a, 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 our own little Mount Sinai by just looking at the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus expounded the law and made it honorable. He opened up the spiritual nature of the law. For instance, the one commandment that slew me back in 1972 when I became a Christian was this. You've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. Seventh commandment. I said to myself as an unregenerate non-Christian, well, if there's heaven, I'll get there because I've never committed adultery. But then I read the words of Jesus, but I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already with her in his heart and was like an arrow hit my chest. I thought, woe is me, I'm undone, when I had the revelation that God saw my thought life and that he was nothing like me, that he considered lust to be adultery and considers hatred to be murder. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord and all liars live their part in the lake of fire. No thief, no blasphemer, no adulterer, no fornicator will inherit God's kingdom. That puts the fear of God in our hearts. Why? Because we have a conscience that bears witness to that law. The work of the law is written on our hearts and the conscience bears witness. We know it's wrong to lie and steal and fornicate and commit adultery and blaspheme because of that inner conscience. Conscience means with knowledge. So on judgment day, we'll be without excuse, as the Bible says, and that should drive us to the cross. And when we look to that cross, that cross should put the fear of God, that God went and put the fear of God in us because it shows us that God so loves justice and truth and righteousness that he would go to such an extreme so that we could be forgiven. That's both bad news for sinners, the cross, and good news. Because if you don't repent and trust in Christ, you're still under God's wrath and heading for hell. And that's horrific. And that breaks the heart of every Christian. Now, you have written a book, How to Make Sure God Hears Your Prayers, which is obviously in line with everything that we're talking about right now, all of these incredibly important topics. What are you hoping people take away from that book? 
Um, I hope they uh, get a right concept of God's nature and character, and I hope they'll be stirred to reach out to the lost. You know, the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, is a reproach on human nature. It's like a doctor who finds a cure to cancer. He's surrounded by patients that are dying in agony. Should we have to tell him, now take that cure to those patients? No, he should run to them because he has compassion on his patients. And it's a reproach that we should be have to told to take the gospel of everlasting life to dying sinners. We should run because we love the lost and are concerned where they'll spend eternity. So that book is to equip Christians to overcome their fears and share their faith with boldness uh, because we've been commanded to and because we love people. You know, it's it's so interesting hearing you say that because your entire ministry, everything that you've done over the years, it's been so powerful to watch, you know, the different outreaches and the unique ways that you engage people. You know, you're very funny, you're very engaging, you challenge people, and you've done so much over the years from film down the line, books, I mean, and, and really looking to meet people where they are and bring them in um, through apologetics and just your tactics, which are, again, um, life-changing, you have something going on right now, um, a London outreach that I'd love to hear more about. Uh, you're always up to something, but tell us about this one. Well, six months ago, I began thinking about the coronation of King Charles on May the 6th and realized that in a church service lasting two to three hours with a witness being witnessed by between two and 300 million people worldwide, He's going to lay his hand on the Bible and promise before God to uphold the biblical truth of salvation by grace, grace through faith. He's going to carry an orb with a cross on the top, a symbolic of the world being under the reign of Jesus Christ. He's going to be given a number of swords. One is a blunt sword, speaking of the sword called the sword of mercy, speaking of the gospel of salvation. And the other is a sharp sword, speaking of the justice of God on judgment day. He's going to be anointed with oil. And so there's 10 incredibly spiritual things that are going to take place. Now, there's argument whether or not it's going to be from his heart or genuine or whatever. It's just tradition. But I began thinking, wouldn't it be great to produce a tract with Charles on the front looking like a 50-pound note uh, called like a million million dollars uh, with the gospel on the back? And so I made a video and shared it with my team. Just after I sent the video, I got an email from a guy who said, what are you doing? What are you working on? So I sent him the video. He sent the ministry $200,000. I sent it to another person, a video, and they sent $50,000. Sent it to someone else, and they sent $100,000. So we have printed something like 11 million of these that we're making available free of charge, and we pay the shipping, no cost whatsoever, to Europe, to United Kingdom, to Australia, to New Zealand, or anywhere throughout the U.S. And what we're doing is exactly what Paul did in Acts chapter 17. When he stood up to preach to the Athenians, he quoted Greek poets. You say, what are you quoting, quoting godless Greek poets for? Well, he was using them as a bridge to reach the lost. So we're not endorsing Prince Charles, King Charles, or saying he's a Christian or whatever. We're saying this is a bridge to reach the ungodly. So we've got something like over 2,000 people, 1,800 from England and 500 from the U.S., actually going to London for the coronation. They're going to give out literally millions of these to the millions who are lying the streets. Plus, we've got millions that have gone out or have been booked to go out throughout the U.S. We've just ordered 4 million this morning. And so we're super excited about this. And anyone can get these free of charge delivered to their door uh, by just going to livingwaters.com forward slash London livingwaters.com forward slash London. Yeah, it's incredible that God lines people up to help with this, right? As you sent that video out and they're sending the money in to make this happen. And you know what, and I think I know the answer to this, but, but what is your end goal hope for this? After May 6th, after the coronation, what do you want to see happen? I want Christians to see how easy it is to give gospel tracts like this to non-Christians. You know, I, we have training courses on how to give out tracts. This is what you do. You extend the arm. When the person takes it, you let it go, and they take it. That's all you have to do. And someone can get saved through this. I mean, it's a six-month training course. It really is easy, but we're held back by our fears. And the Bible likens us to firefighters in the book of Jude. When a firefighter arrives at a... Uh, 
a fire. He looks up and he sees someone on fifth story. It's a lady with two children and there's flames leaping out and licking their clothes and they're screaming. He has to climb a 60 foot ladder. Would he rather be home with his family watching an old black and white movie on TV? Of course. Is he terrified? Of course. But he doesn't think of himself. He thinks of that woman and her terrible fate, the fate of those children. So that's how he gets rid of his fears because he's a firefighter. Excuse me. And the Bible says, others saving with fear, having compassion, pulling them from the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. I get fearful when it goes to giving, giving someone out a track, standing up on a, on, on a box to preach open air. I get nervous, but I ignore my fears because I don't think of myself. I think of other people, unsaved people and their fate. They're not only going to pass through death, which is horrific enough, but they're going to face a holy God and a lake of fire, and that should take our breath away, and that compassion should cause us to want to reach out to the lost. And that's what I hope happens. I hope a lot of people will be inspired when they do this, and uh, a lot of people are. Millions of tracks have already been ordered, so we're super excited about this. So, you know, and I think it's important you mentioned, too, that you still get that nervousness because a lot of people, they think that, you know, the fear holds them back and that it's never going to go away. But fear can be a motivator, too. You know, fear can motivate us, especially when there's compassion, as you were just referencing, for all those people you're thinking of. You know, that's an important yes. thing. Yeah. Um, fear can do that. The perfect love casts out all fear. Love can cast out all fear. Let me share a key that I use to reaching the lost and dealing with my fears. Um, I know that when every human being, not only is there a conscience, a knowledge of right and wrong, which I can appeal to with the commandments, but there's a will to live. People are not primates. They're not beasts. They're not dogs, cats, horses, or cows. They're made in the image of God. God has placed eternity in their hearts, and something in them says, I don't want to die. In fact, the book of Hebrews says, in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, every human being is haunted by the fear of death, all their lifetime. So I appeal to the will to live by just saying to people, do you think there's an afterlife? Are you afraid of dying? Did you know the Bible gives the answer to death? Think of a waitress. She looks up and she sees three businessmen, three piece suits, little dark suitcases, sit at a table and begin kneel, wheeling and dealing millions of dollars. Is she intimidated by them? Of course not. She just walks straight up and while they're talking, she just says, can I take your order? Why is she so bold? It's because she has, she knows she has what they want. They are there for food, and that's what makes her bold. And you and I, Billy, have what this world wants more than anything. We have got millions who go to gyms, little torture houses, to do all these torturous things to try and extend their lives a little bit, or they eat food that really isn't pleasant because they want to be healthy and extend their lives. We have found everlasting life. So if they only knew what we had, so we must be bold because we know what we've got, what they want. Jesus used this principle in John chapter 3 with the woman at the well. He says, if you knew the gift of God, you'd ask of him, he'd give you living water. And if the world knew what we had in Christ, that we're not religious, we're not anti all these different peoples. We love them. We've found everlasting life, and we just want to give them what they're searching for. So that's what produces boldness in a waitress. She knows she has what they want, and we know we have what this world wants. And so we appeal to their will to live and say things like, did you know in the Old Testament God promised to destroy death? And in the New Testament, we're told Harry did it. When I say that to people, they go, I didn't know that. And their eyes widen because I know I'm scratching where they itch. They are fearful of dying, and I'm talking about knowing for certain how to find everlasting life. That's the promise of the gospel. So my final question for you, and it's kind of piggybacking off of that, you know, a lot of people are looking at culture right now, and obviously it's chaotic. There's a lot happening. But at the same time, you have these other things unfolding. You have popular TV shows that are based on the gospel coming out. You have Jesus Revolution. You have Asbury and the revivals, and there's lots of debate about that too. Pretty much everything there's debate over, but there are some looking at all of this and saying, huh, are we having a revival of some sorts, even though everything else around us is falling apart? Are there pockets of revival? What has been your thought and reflection on some of what we've been watching in recent months? Well, I'll be impressed when, uh, if this is a move of God that'll move out of the church. If this is a pocket of revival, let's empty the pocket out into the world. That's what happened in the book of Acts. They didn't stay in the upper room and worship the Lord. 
they went down and began preaching the gospel to every creature as they have been commanded to. Think of what happened on, this, uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration when the disciples saw Jesus ascend to heaven. The angel said, the same Jesus will come in like manner. Well, in like manner when he comes, second coming is power, clouds, great glory. He must have gone, it seems. It wasn't like, beam me up, Scotty. It was, and the disciples were standing there, and the angel said, men of Galilee, why are you gazing up to heaven? Go down and receive the power from on high. In other words, there's a world going to hell. There's a world sitting in the shadow of death. You've been given everlasting life. Now go and preach the gospel to every creature. So all these pockets of revival and these moves of God will be seen to be moves of God when they move out and do what the disciples did and take the gospel to every creature. That's what I want to see happen. Well, Ray, I so appreciate your time today. Thank you for coming on. The book is How to Make Sure God Hears Your Prayers. And can you throw out that website again for people who want to grab the track? Yeah, sure. It's livingwaters.com forward slash London, livingwaters.com forward slash London. Free tracks and by the millions and free shipping. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Billy.